1956, Vivian made sure she won back the headlines by announcing she was pregnant. Whether it was true or not, she attracted further attention when she claimed to have had another miscarriage. Whether she was pregnant at that time and had a miscarriage, who knows? I mean, some say yes, some say no, but she suddenly announced to the world that that's what had happened. So that was very difficult indeed, and, um, and certainly sort of another step to the collapse of the marriage. Although they continued to play their roles as a celebrity couple in public, Olivier had finally had enough. One night, Vivian was creating a big fuss on account of being ill, but Olivier picked her up and uh, was really in intending to throw her onto the bed, but as he threw her, she caught the side of her, her eye on the side of a, of a chest of drawers, and at that point, the doctors really said, you know, look, this is getting very serious, and that could have been, you know, you could have killed her, basically. It was the day before, well, one of the famous visits to the uh, House of Parliament when there are pictures of Vivian with an eye patch, which she said she had been bitten by a mosquito. That was not the case. And so it was almost really a decision had to be made. They must part. And um, after that, they never really got back together. I mean, they did and they didn't, but um, it was effectively over. I think that Olivier signaled the break with Vivian by deciding to sell Notley Abbey the place that Vivian had come to love. It was sold out almost from underneath her. Uh, I think that signaled that Olivier was going to make a new life with a new woman in his life who was Joan Plowright. Vivian sought revenge, trying to make everyone think Joan Plowright was to blame for the collapse of her marriage. When Larry was doing um, The Entertainer, uh, that was when he met Joan Plowright, and uh, she really twigged that something was probably going on, and she used to go and stand at the back of the audience and harass them. It was a very difficult time. I mean, I, I was not the sort of girl who breaks up marriages. We all knew that there had been the, the love affair with Peter Finch, and from then on that uh, the marriage had not really been very close. She had tried to persuade him that they could go on pretending. Well, now, how about your private life, if one may inquire? How no, the... one may not inquire. One may not inquire. Well, thank you very much, Lady Livingston. So ended the romantic fantasy of their marriage, to the dismay of their fans. People felt let down, I think, when it didn't work out. I, mean, I remember my mother saying how sorry she was when they broke up. She hardly, she knew them through films and so on, because they were newsworthy and you'd lived with them through their marriage and this wonderful fantasy life. Warner Brothers takes pride in presenting an important new... But Vivian didn't give up, once again throwing herself into her work as a respite from her mental illness. The Roman Spring of Mrs Stone was another Tennessee Williams drama and one of her last film roles. The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone almost reflected the state that she was in after her divorce. That's to say, a woman who was increasingly passing through the middle age of the emotions, who felt abandoned, and yet who had got the strength of mind and will and sexuality to go on through life, gaining new experience and hoping for new love. Paolo. What is it? Oh, nothing. Is it's just so silly. I, I, I just lost my sunglasses. <laughs> when I'm late for an appointment. She was marvellous. She coaxed a performance out of Warren Beatty as the young gigolo that I don't think even Warren knew he, he had in him. When the time comes when nobody desires me for myself, I'd rather not be desired at all. Warren, by the way, was going out with Joan Collins at the time. And when uh, Vivian met Joan, she just looked at Warren and said, too common for you. Vin was living in a flat at Eaton Square by now, which she had bought with Olivier as their London base before they split up. She lived there for nearly seven years after her divorce. She was happy as she could be. I mean, obviously, she wasn't 100% happy because she was still in love with Larry and she didn't want the divorce. But she was a realist. And once he was married to Joan Plowright and they started having children, she realised that that was it. But she never stopped loving him. 
Never. She wasn't happy. She had the good fortune of having Jack Merrivale, who was a very nice man, an actual friend of Larry's, and he sort of stepped into the breach and uh, looked after her, but uh, it, was, it was never the same. I don't think somehow it was the same for Larry either. They were so perfectly matched together. Jack Merrivale was the one who took over, and Jack Merrivale looked after Vivian in his last and her last years, and he was terribly good with her because you had to be really on her case all the time. You couldn't leave her. She was unreliable, she was a flake, she was sometimes suicidal, sometimes manic, sometimes very down, sometimes very up, and she needed constant care and attention. With that disease, there is a, a terrible sex thing as well. You know, they become very uh, fiendish about sex. And uh, once, when she rung me up and asked me, said, come and have tea with me. So I said, OK. And I was there half an hour later, I suppose. By the time I got there, she was gone. And I said to the maid, well, where, where is she? And she said, I don't know. She just suddenly said she had to go out. And she'd be back in half an hour. And she came back. It had been pouring with rain. She was bedraggled. She looked terrible. She was covered in mud. And she'd been in the square with somebody. And things like that happened all the time. Vivian's health continued to deteriorate. In 1967, a severe TB attack forced her to withdraw from rehearsals for a new play. She always had a cough, you know. She was very, very thin. I mean, she was basically a small woman, but she was really thin, too thin, you know. And it was something she'd always got to fight, but she hated illness and she hated to talk about it. And she never mentioned it if she could help it. But I stopped the doctor on the way in and I said, you know, doctor, I don't think Miss Lee's getting any better. Her cough is terrible. And he said, who's treating her, you or me? Well, I'm afraid he didn't treat her at all well because he simply didn't know what he was doing. See, tuberculosis in the late 60s had been eradicated, more or less. I think that young doctors knew nothing much about it and also, I think, didn't take it seriously enough. It's like a bad case of bronchitis or something, you know. She was advised to rest. She didn't rest. She went on as much as she could. She was receiving friends. And I can't help feeling that a tiny part of her just felt, you know, that the game was up. She was in bed, but she was, she'd was she been up and done the flowers. She always said, Rosemary, dear, you can't arrange flowers, and she was more than right there. So she always did them herself. And she got up and did the flowers and everything, and she was coughing a lot 